off in the salty ocean, off where the waves roll free. The sparkling water rises, then crashes to the sea. Out amongst the breakers, you'll have no need to fear. It's true, it's the blue frontier. Welcome to the latest episode of Rising Tide, the Ocean Podcast. This is David Helvarg and Vicki Nichols Goldstein of the Inland Ocean Coalition is joining us from, let's see now, it's Helsinki this time, right? Absolutely. Cool. Today we're talking with oceanographer, marine ecologist, Sarah Frias Torres, who studies how coral reefs and marine megafauna, like big fish, can recover from overfishing just in time to try and survive the impacts of climate change. Sarah's worked with NOAA, NASA, the UN, Paul Allen's Vulcan, as Smithsonian Marine Station and others, trying to figure out how we grow ocean solutions faster than the problems. One of the solutions I know Vicky and I want to talk about with her is the recovery of the Atlantic Goliath groupers in Florida and the Caribbean. But before that, we have blue news you can use. Vicky? Wow, this is pretty cool. The United Nations just announced that 2022 was the first year that more seafood was produced through aquaculture or sea farming than from wild catch fishing. What the heck do you guys think about that? That's some new blue news. Well, I, I think it's possible to do both community-based sustainable fishing of edible marine wildlife and carbon-friendly food production, like we discussed with a previous guest, Neil Sims of Ocean Era, uh, who I met with in Hawaii. Of course, I don't think expanding aquaculture necessarily means we end overfishing. I mean, you know, we plow the Midwest and yet herds of millions of buffalo didn't get to keep grazing the uh, plains. So uh, lots of challenges and lots of questions for you too, Sarah. But the first one we always ask our guests is, um, how did you first connect with the ocean? Um, well, thank you for having me here, first of all. So when I was five years old, two important events happened in my life. First, we spent the, the summer family vacation in Mallorca, in the Balearic Islands, in the Mediterranean Sea. And second, my dad gave me this teeny tiny dive mask with the snorkel and everything. I mean, I'm a five-year-old little girl, you know, that was a teeny tiny thing. And he said, let's go snorkeling together. That's because from the moment I knew how to walk, every time we'll go to the beach, I'll just jump into the waves and follow, following my dad. He was an avid snorkeler and freediver. And he decided, okay, I cannot prevent you from following me, but let's just, just, let's go snorkel together. And right there, I discovered, imagine, I mean, this is the Balearic Islands, the water uh, visibility, the ocean is almost gene clear. Um, and so right away, I, I discovered this amazing new world with all these beautiful creatures I didn't understand with all these different shapes and colors and so my dad, at the end of every snorkel trip, he will explain, so this is an anemone and this is a sea urchin. He will give the names of things, right? So that first discovery and all the different summers afterwards doing the same thing, snorkeling with my dad, and obviously a constant supply of Jacques Cousteau ocean Specials. documentaries every <laughs> Sunday afternoon over the years, that generated this passion for the ocean that continues to this day. And and so you went to school knowing you were interested in oceanography? Yes, I knew. I didn't know the words. I knew I wanted to be a marine biologist, whatever words I was using. But remember, it was not an easy goal to achieve. By accident of geography and history, I was born and raised in Barcelona. And all from birth to my preteens, there was a fascist dictatorship still in the country. So when you're a little girl born in those conditions, all that society expects of you is to grow up, get married, and have many, many children for el bien de la iglesia y la nación, for the good of the church and the nation. That was the only purpose in your life. If, if that is your choice, that's fine. But it becomes a problem with, when it's imposed by the Catholic Church and the fascist dictatorship. I was lucky that my parents had great expectations for me. They and they quickly realized I was very, very smart. And I will just absorb 
science in a way that they've never seen before. <laughs> I was really a scientist from birth. So they made every effort to ensure that I had access to a great school and then whatever it took so I could go into university. Great. So Franco did something good for the environment. He died and the dictatorship <laughs> ended. He died, and- you know, <laughs> finally he died. And I got into <laughs> university at a time when there was a different government. And they figured out that it was good to educate the citizens. In my case, because I was from a working class family, if you didn't have the money to go to university, but if you had good grades, then there should be a mechanism to help you to get into university. So I went through all the years of university education thanks to uh, a government scholarship that paid for tuition, books, and so forth. You know, so it was that, that brief time in this history of Spain where. Uh, you know, hard work really resulted on something good. Awesome. So democracy matters. Where and when did you get your your ocean degrees in marine biology and oceanography? So I earned my Bachelor of Science in Marine Ecology at the University of Barcelona. And then I secured uh, a fellowship because, again, that was the only way to advance in my in my education. I secured a fellowship from the British Council and a, and a foundation to go to the UK. So I earned my Master's of Science in Marine Conservation in the UK, University of Bangor. And then I returned to Barcelona because I wanted to do research in, in the Mediterranean Sea. By the time I finished university, I, I had become certified, scuba diving certified. And my dives in the Mediterranean were very different from my first snorkeling trip in, in Mallorca because I realized that all the world of Jacques Cousteau was gone. You know, the Mediterranean Sea was very empty. See, that's something you realize when you truly go scuba diving and you look for the big, there are no big fish left. I mean, you have to go to a marine reserve to see any big fish. Everywhere else, they're all gone. And so there was this awakening in me that said, okay, I want to do research to find out how we can conserve and restore the Mediterranean Sea. So when I returned from the UK, then I attempted several times to secure um, fellowships to do doctoral research in Spain, in Barcelona. But consistently, both the government, the central government in Madrid and the Catalan government in Barcelona, they came back to me saying the ocean is not a priority area for us. We're not interested. We, we've already well, overfished and polluted it. I, I don't know if you look at the same map that I look at, but in all images from space or any map, you will see that the country is surrounded by ocean. Exactly. And uh, Spain has about the third of the fourth most powerful fishing fleet in the world. And, and the ocean is our constant source of income for tourism. And and the Spanish fishing fleet does not have a good global no, reputation. It's terrible. It's a mafia. It's a cartel, Spanish fishing cartels. That's what they are. I mean, I'm not saying anything secret. Everybody knows. It. The, the shock was that I realized no matter how good I was and how well trained I was, my country didn't want me. Spanish investment in scientific research is ridiculous. It's just a joke. Really, it's just non-existent. Uh, in fact, Spain is a net exporter of scientists and engineers. That's one of the national products. Uh, the choice was either I go wherever I need to go to be to, to do scientific research or I remain in Spain and I never do what I want to do. I try many different countries and eventually it turns out that the U.S. government recruited me through the Fulbright program to do Excellent. scientific research in the United States to start my doctoral research. It, it is easier to get hit by lighting that secure a Fulbright a spot in the Fulbright Fellowship Program. And so I said, Let, let's go for it. You know, the rest is history. That's where I worked on these other amazing places. Eventually, I became a U.S. citizen. <laughs> so that's the journey. <laughs> wow. And and so you left overfished, polluted, and disinterested Spain and yes. ended up in the state of Florida. So uh, some things <laughs> must feel familiar. Yeah, that's an interesting I thing. know. Yeah. <laughs> I know it's, uh, let me tell you, for a marine biologist, Florida is a wonderland because it's the one place where, where you have the convergence of sea turtles and manatees and giant fish like Goliath Looper, and mm-hmm. you have the North Atlantic right whale comes to visit. And then you have the Everglades and you have these incredible natural wonders in Florida. And at the time when I arrived, Florida was a powerhouse of scientific and engineering 
uh, production. So you have NASA Kennedy Space Center, where I worked for some time. You have NOAA and all the universities. I mean, it was a fantastic place. 20 plus years later, the place is quite a bit different. Tell me, I, yeah. I know when I first... I mean, I was 10 years later than you. I was 15 when I got a mask and snorkel in the Florida Keys and suddenly realized there are whole alien worlds right off the shore. But that was 90% live coral cover. Today, it's like 3%. There's been a lot of loss. There's also there's some places around NASA up in Cape Canaveral that were de facto marine protected areas. It was for security for the rocket base. But the waters up there are still amazing. Tell us some of the places you've, you've seen underwater in Florida. Right now, the average life coral cover is 2%, seven awesome. less, right? There's still some brilliant spots, like if you go all the way to Bright Tortugas of Key West, you know, you'll see better conditions. But as a whole, it's 2%. So when do you do reach that number, you are it's no longer a coral reef. Let's start with the health of the coral reef. And so we yeah. know there's been that recent heat wave that has really impacted it. There's water quality issues. Take us up, out from like a large view down to a closer view and uh, talk about what has the impacts been to really destroy this reef that we, that I learned how to dive in and was amazed at many, many years ago. So by the time both of you visited the Florida Keys for the first time, and I visited, so my first dive in the Florida Keys was in Lukey, which was fantastic. At the mm-hmm. time, there was still, you know, Elkhorn Coral and Stockholm Coral and Pillar Coral, which is now extinct. Lots of fish, all the species you can imagine. It was fantastic. But even at those times we visited, the, the Florida Keys was already going down. It was mm-hmm. already quite degraded. So imagine even in that state of degradation, we got to experience a living coral reef. The decline of the Florida coral reef track. It's been a death by a thousand cuts. The the latest heat wave, which cooked alive the the corals, they didn't even go through a bleaching phase. They just were cooked alive. So, but even way before what happened last summer, the coral reefs in Florida had been already heavily impacted. So uh, when I say death by a thousand cuts, it starts with all the changes that happen in Florida, all the channeling of the uh, Everglades, all the changes in water quality, all the pollution that has gone into into the waters of Florida. And then you have all this coastal development going on. So now the water quality means that it's not as clear as it should be, which is what corals need. Imagine all the all the releases of fertilizers and pesticides and you know all sorts of nasty things that kills corals. Then around the 1980s, there was a disease that killed um, most of the sea urchins. They died, Dima sea urchins, long spine sea urchins, and they take care of cleaning up the coral reef, eating the algae. Further degradation coming from overfishing. You need to have a healthy fish population, but that is not the case in the Florida Keys. And then eventually there was this terrible disease, which is what I call the Ebola for corals, which is the stony coral tissue loss disease. All, all evidence points that started in Miami with the new dredging of the port of Miami. So that is a disease that digests the corals from the inside out. So that's a true Ebola for corals. It's gone. I, I just read a piece in the LA Times of the ocean's a hot mess. People don't get, there is no Florida coral reef, you're saying. There's coral patches. For definition, no. The Florida coral reef track used to be I'm using the past tense here, the third largest barrier reef in the world. But when you hit 2% light coral cover, by definition, we're talking, are we using our dictionary? Are we using our textbook definition? Yes. So by definition, you are no longer a coral reef. So tragic because the whole National Marine Sanctuary Florida Keys was based on this very healthy ecosystem. And that has really collapsed. Correct. Now, I have to say the dead corals are still there. They're, they still have a structure. They're still providing habitat for the red fish. And so people who are not familiar with what a coral reef is, they will go snorkeling or diving and they will say, it's wonderful. It's full of fish. Yes, it's full of fish. But and dead rock. And dead rock, which used to be corals. Uh, but the danger is that if they're not alive, that means they er- erosion goes really fast. 
So mm-hmm. you lose the structure of the coral reef very fast. And so you lose also very fast the capacity of the coral reef to protect you from storms and hurricanes. So there's two things, two responses. One is, let's say, triage, which is we save Correct. what we can while we can. Yes. Or two yes. is denial, which is Governor no. DeSantos of Florida <laughs> just yes, issued just issued a uh, an executive order saying that no state agencies can no longer use the term climate change. There's a saying in the old country, we say, no puedes tapar el sol con un dedo, which means you cannot cover the sun with one finger. You cannot mm-hmm. deny reality just by not using certain words. You'll never be able to do that. I mean, climate change is here. I want to actually transition a little bit away from the coral reefs per se, because we know they are significantly impacted. And I want to start talking about the Goliath grouper, because that is one of the big gems that we still have in that region and in Florida. And there's a really interesting history and we'll see where the future goes. But tell us about this amazing, gorgeous animal. Nothing prepares you for that first encounter with a Goliath grouper. It's like in the same way that nothing prepares you to dive with a whale shark. I mean, nothing prepares you to to be in the ocean with a massive creature. And and how did you run into your first? (laughs) Uh, I was on purpose. So I was in charge of discovering or quantifying if there were any juvenile Goliath groupers back in the in the Florida Keys. So the second largest, but it's still big enough, is the Goliath grouper, Epinephalus Itahara. And Itahara means the Lord of the Rocks. I mean, nice. that's a fantastic name. If you go to a park and say, hey, what's your name? I'm the Lord of the Rocks. Look, <laughs> you've, won the, you've won the game right there. So it is magnificent to have such an encounter. When I was there as a kid, there were lots of big groupers in the water. And then what? So what happened is that um, eventually, with the fashion started by Ernst Hemingway and others like him, you know, it became fashionable to catch big fish. So that's trophy fishing. Uh, and so they initially they were a target of trophy fishing. But uh, eventually it became also part of a commercial fishery that was used just to produce cat food and, you know, smuggle drugs up to New York in the carcasses of the big fish. That's pretty much what it was used for. So it was never... Uh, a food source for desperate people at all. Uh, but as I said, because it's a fish that lives in the slow lane, it's very easy to overfish that, that kind of species. So eventually they got the fishing pressure was to such a point that by the late 1980s, it became commercially extinct. Have you gone to the mangroves to look at the babies? Yes, that was I was the crazy Catalan scientist who was courageous enough to snorkel in the mangroves of the Florida Keys. So my mission was to, okay, is there anything in the mangroves of the Florida Keys? And I discovered that nobody had looked into it because it it is hell. Snorkeling in those mangroves is just, you talk about mosquitoes. Yeah, the mosquitoes will go into your snorkel and you will eventually inhale mosquitoes. Worst uh, snorkeling of your life. (laughs) But but if it was only that, you could manage. The problem is that underwater in the mangroves, because you are, moving around the mangrove crop roots because they're looking uh no amazingly their visibility was is quite good it could be quite good that is not the problem the problem is that um, at the bottom you have what's called the upside down jellyfish cassiopeia oh. and whoever wrote in whatever textbook that cassiopeia don't sting i mean i have some <laughs> words for that person so let me ask you you're floating between the mosquitoes <laughs> yes. and the jellies <laughs> Exactly. There in the Florida Key mangroves, did you find yes. any juvenile uh, groupers? I did. I did find <laughs> the juvenile Goliath groupers. I did find it. And they were the, the cutest thing ever because those were mini, the mini me's, you know, the mini Goliath grouper, all perfect shape <laughs> and all these beautiful colors. And I published that work and all that. That was a, an awakening moment. Like they are coming back. That th- Those encounters were you know, amazing, a validation of, of all my hypotheses. Yes, they are expanding uh, their territory, but the actually magnificent moment was when then I was also diving in the in the reefs, looking at spawning aggregations, and that's when I encountered the big ones, the really mm-hmm. big live groupers. And that, that is amazing. 
It's amazing because they are just massive, massive. And they are curious. They and, and they're protected now. So after the, the near extinction, <clears throat> two key fishermen, they did a complete 180. They realized we cannot do this. We're having an American bison moment where we're just exterminating these magnificent animals. They reached out to scientists and to Florida Fish and Wildlife, right? So that's when in 1990, uh, there was a, a state and federal fishing moratorium, or what's called a moratorium on harvest, for these species. So that means they are de facto protected. Yeah, so it's like, wow, we finally have some protections in place. Hey, life is looking good for the groupers. Correct. So I started my research on Goliath grouper in 2003, and I was tasked to see, okay, are they juveniles in the mangroves? Are they expanding territory? but also what's happening in the spawning aggregations. And at the time, there were only two sites on the Atlantic Florida coast. We had few low numbers, like maybe 20 individuals at a time. So in 2010, 2012, in one of the spawning aggregations, that was a hole in the wall, I counted up to 50 adult Goliath groupers that had gathered in the spawning aggregation. I mean, that is a great number. But remember, there's only two spawning aggregations left in the Atlantic coast and one off Key West at that time. So it's a, it's a good, it was a good sign to see in this increased number, but also around the same time, all along all these years, at every Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission public meeting where they talk about fish issues and whatnot, there was always a push to reopen the fishery, even under the, the moratorium, the moratorium of harvest, there was this push. And at every meeting I went to speak not only about the science, but also about the scuba diving community that was now just paying money just to dive with the Goliath groupers. Eventually I managed to have the scuba divers and the dive businesses and DIMA, which is the organization that gathers all the scuba divers, all professional businesses and scuba diving, to speak at those meetings. You know, so I kind of energized all this community that was making money out of not killing the Goliath groupers, just diving and looking at them. To so say a live grouper is worth exactly. more than yeah, a Yeah, they are worth more alive than that. But even then, back in 2012, we started to see in the spawning aggregations, uh, Goliath groupers with uh, spears in their body. So dying from a spear in the belly, you know, a spear on the side. So that revealed that there was poaching going on in the spawning aggregations themselves. And we uh, reported this to the government and so forth. Anyway, long story short, because there's been the, even under the moratorium, there's been this constant pressure from recreational fishers to hit the, the adults in the spawning aggregations, but also to, uh, you know, do this, what they call catch and release for the juveniles in the mangroves. Uh, we've seen the numbers going down. There's been catastrophic deaths from uh, cold water events back in 2010, for example. So uh, the water can get very, very cold and that kills most of the juveniles in the mangroves, but also when you have these massive red tides, these fish mortality events, you can also, then you lose the the adults as well from red tides. So you have this sandwich of, on the one hand, the species is protected through a moratorium, but on the other hand, you have all these external events from cold water events, red tides, and also the, the fishing pressure from recreational fishers, you know, impacting the population. We have reached a point now that even under the moratorium uh, for the fish and wildlife, approve what they call a limited catch, which is kill, which is a kill fishery, which kills those juveniles that are just going out from the mangrove into the reef. It targets that group size, which are the most valuable for the population. But it was also shocking. I attended all the meetings in preparation for that. Some of them happened during the pandemic. So they were, you know, through video conference and whatnot. Mm-hmm. And you could see from the from the get go that it was just uh, a circus. It was just a charade. They have already made that decision. They just had to go through all this process of making these meetings to validate a crime. This is an environmental crime. There's no scientific evidence to support the opening of this fishery. That is the point. So this agency, Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, that's the full name, has decided to deny science. That's the big point. I mean, are we using science to manage our natural resources or are we not? 
That is the big question. And so what happened here, they denied science. And even worse, they invented numbers that don't exist. So not only they deny the actual scientists that they make magic of their own. I mean, and all the scientists working on these species who are not affiliated with this organization or this institution, we have called them on that. We have shown them the numbers. We asked them, where do you find these magic fish? They don't exist, right? So yeah, I, I think the worst part here is the denial of science. And the killing of, of fish that potentially are, are the, the killing are of fish back. that not only they are recovering and they have shown they have the potential to recover. You just don't, if you don't kill them, they recover, which is amazing. Isn't that amazing? You know, that yeah. <laughs> stop science right there. If even a chance, it comes back. You just, if you stop killing it, it comes back. So my hope is with the Goliath groupers and also with the very enthusiastic people in Florida from scuba divers to even fishers, to fishers to business people, to tourists, they pay to dive with these live animals, magnificent animals. So my hope is there because they are the ones that have energized the conversation and they're completely against this uh, killing, you know, sanctioned by this state agency that is not using science. So my hope is with the collide groupers and with the people of Florida. So it is time for a change and to have all agencies that manage uh, our wildlife and wildlife pla- and wild places to follow science, to use science-based management, which is not happening in this case. That's where I put my money. So let's let's vote because the groupers can't. Yes, <laughs> I love it. Let's vote. And it's time to move those commissioners. Vote for science. Yes, yeah. let's vote for science. The groupers <laughs> are have a, a very vital function in, in the reef, coral reef, any kind of reef and all marine ecosystems. Um, they, they control all the fish populations. They have even been shown to eat the invasive lionfish. Wow. So okay. To that. Go so, grouper. Go grouper. Go <laughs> That's the cry. Go Sarah, it's, it's been, it's been awesome talking with you and um, Sarah Frias Torres, uh, marine biologist, Friend of the grouper, expert of the grouper, it's been really delightful talking with you on the Rising Tide Ocean podcast. Thank you so much. And the bottom line, let's vote to keep the groupers alive. Yes, let's do that. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Rising Tide, the Ocean podcast is a production of Blue Frontier, co-hosted by Blue Frontier's David Halvard and Vicki nichols Goldstein of the Inland Ocean Coalition, with production support from Holden Hardcastle of Fluid Studios, Natasha Benjamin and Nick Paz, and editing services provided by Charles Landon of Studio Cape May. You can find Rising Tide at bluefront.org or on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you download your podcast. And don't forget to recommend the Rising Tide Ocean podcast to your friends and other ocean lovers. Off in the salty ocean, off where the waves roll free. The sparkling water rises, then crashes to the sea. Out amongst the breakers, you'll have no need to fear. It's true, it's the blue frontier. Tear, tear, tear. Off in the salty ocean, off to the blue frontier. Sparky, come here, buddy. Sparky, there you are. Good boy, Sparky.